Welcome to Wine Talks with Paul Kay, and we are on an away game today at the Trincaro Winery in the Napa Valley, and we're about to have an incredible conversation with Karen Cakebread of Ziata Wines, and this is going to be a fascinating story because we have lots to talk about. Uh, Wine Talks is always sponsored by the Original Wine of the Month Club, featuring the Biodynamic Organic Series of Wines, as well as Napa, Bordeaux, and Sweet. Um, I'm not even sure where to start this conversation because it, there's so much to talk about. You have so much history. Um, but I want to play a little game with you. So, you ready? I'm ready. Welcome to the show, by Thank the way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, we were here yesterday having lunch, you know, so it's kind of like I feel like this is our, our new hangout when we come to, uh, come to the Napa Valley. All right, so I'm going to name, name th- this is a book called uh, Wine is the Best Medicine. It's a transcription of a French book from the 50s written by Dr. E. A. Morey. And he's got, it's in, in the back it says, in, in vino curatus, which I'm supposed means in wine there's wine cure. Wine cures. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name three ailments in three varietals or districts, and I'm going to see if you can see what he was thinking. Okay, let's go. I don't think there's any wrong answers <laughs> to this. It's just, okay, it's good. Just, it's just for fun. So the first one is diarrhea. The second one is gout. And the third one is nervous depression. And your choices are Medoc, Bordeaux, Beaujolais, or a Sancerre. So which would diarrhea be cured by? Sancerre. Oh, ding, ding, ding. ding. <laughs> that was wrong. Uh, Beaujolais. Oh. Uh, but here's right. the dosage. Four glasses a day. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> that could cause another problem. So I'm trying to, yeah, exactly. I'm trying to figure out how this guy figured this out, right? Like, okay. It doesn't say. Maybe he has, uh, you know, experience with right, it. Right, maybe. I don't know. So, okay. So now we have left, we have two. So now you, you've only got a 50 50 shot at it. Okay. We have gout and nervous depression. We have the Medoc and we have Sancerre. Okay. Um, if I was having nervous depression, da, 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 da. I, I, I guess I'm all about Sancerre now. Da, 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 for which? <laughs> oh, um, nervous depression. Oh, gosh, darn it. Okay, I'm failing. Nervous I told you I don't like Nervous depression was the Medoc. Oh. And that right. is four large glasses a day. Oh, large. And then, can you imagine getting a prescription from the doctor saying, you know, whatever they use in Latin, four right. glasses of Medoc a day. <laughs> um, so, it's so it's so fun to be here, just having a little fun with you on this. Uh, there's, I want to finish this book, actually, so I can be more authoritative on wine cures. Okay, I'm, but, I look forward to that. But, but we, I want to talk about your, your history in this industry. You've been, you've been around a long time. You've done a lot of things. Uh, we have now the... There's this bad sound. Uh, my sound engineer just dropped his phone. Hmm. Um, you started Ziata Wines as a... Why would you do this in this industry? Why not? Right. You know, <laughs> I, I, live in, I live in Napa Valley. I live in wine country. So. What brought you here in the first place? Well, um, let's see. How much time do we have? Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so back in the day, I, I grew up in the other valley, uh, Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, just south of San Francisco. And I uh, met a guy at work working for Hewlett Packard. Uh, he had a funny last name of Cake Bread. And that is funny. Yeah, I, I thought it was really strange. And then he mentioned that his family had a winery in, in Napa Valley. So I didn't think too much of it because I, I had been coming up to Napa and wine tasting. And I had been taking some classes at uh, the local college because I did have an innate interest in wine. But I never knew it was going to bring me to wine country. And I would be... About when was that? 70 something? Um, yes. No, wait, wait. We're, not yes. Gonna, we're not going back, you know, we're not trying yes. to yes. keep you down to an age. Yes. Um, yeah, I started working at Hewlett Packard in the late 70s, and then, um, and then I got married in the early 80s. Well, you know, I was a Hewlett Packard VAR. Oh, in 1984. Were you really? <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. Well, there you go. We, we sold the 9,000s and the, and the image database, and uh, oh my we, were, gosh. we were a high t- small, really small company, but that was what we did. We both ended up in the wine business. What a small world. Yeah, isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. So when did you decide that, you know, because, you know, wine is a, there's an aha, usually there's an aha moment, right? Somebody says, somebody, you taste something or you do something or you have a pairing of food and wine and you go, oh, you know what? There's something really interesting about this. 
Well, um, it, it's, it started with uh, going to fundraisers and nonprofit events and pouring wine with the Cake Bread family. And I think that that was sort of my early introduction. And when Steve and I were married, we used to come up from um, Silicon Valley and up to the winery and spend a couple nights. And they obviously needed to put us to work. So I recall the days when that little tasting room out in front was nothing but a desk and with, a, really? you know, some wine shelves behind me. And, you know, we still wrote out the orders on a three-part carbon copy order form and wow. everything was by hand yeah. then, which was, I think about it now, it's pretty amazing. So I, I had to go all the way to Asia to really immerse myself in the wine um, industry because when a year after Steve and I married, he got an opportunity and offered to go to Hong Kong. And um, wow. he came home from work one day and he said, what do you think? I said, sure, why not? I Yay. was an adventurous, <laughs> adventurous yeah, soul. So I was like, okay. So that company sends you out. You, you spend some time, you, a week kind of poking around to see if this is something you could really do and live in. Um, so we were there for two years. And I started coming back from Hong Kong a couple times a year. And I would come back during harvest. So Dolores would put me to work. In the, so he was still in the high tech Yes, he time, always in stayed Kong. in. He always yeah. stayed in tech, and he's two. So there's three sons. He's he's the oldest. The other two ended up in the business, but he never did. He stayed so, in the and tech. The winery starts seventy three. Yes, which is you know pre Judgment of Paris. Uh, you know, it's still a passionate part of the business. The pre sort of you know astronomical property prices. It was strictly just because of the love of of what it is. Yeah, it was a, yeah. It, and you were. When did you start working at the winery? Well, when we were living overseas, you know, Jack had a vision of being uh, an international brand, an internationally known brand. So he really wanted to ex start exporting wines. And Japan was one of the first countries that uh, it was the first export market. And right around that time, we were living in Hong Kong. And I started working with the importer in Hong Kong. So we got set up that little island. And then um, we came back from Hong Kong after two years. And I went back to work at HP. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, so, because they had to hold a job for me um, because I was an expat wife. Are they in Sunnyvale then? No. Oh, they're, they're all over. Palo Alto, at Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, Cupertino. Uh, yeah, Cupertino. Yeah, that's yeah, where we went. We lot, went there a couple times. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of places. But we came back. I went back to HP. And uh, didn't think too much about the wine industry. And then a year later, Steve came home and said, how would you like to go to Singapore? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I think I just unpacked the last box. Yeah, and now, there? why couldn't we have done that when we were over there? Yeah. No, but we came home for a year and then we packed up and went back out to Singapore. Still on high tech. Yes, yes. And so that's when I really got involved more with the winery. We found a, a, a importer in Singapore. And so I worked closely with them. Back in that day, it was all the fine dining restaurants were in hotels, all, all run by yeah. Europeans. And so it was a bit of a hard sell in the beginning, but we, uh, you know, we made some progress. When you live in a market that you're selling to, it's, you just get to know people and you get some placement. Well, you, said, you said two interesting things. One is you started with Japan, which and I, want, I had that on the list of things I want to talk to you about since you were into the marketing side of Cake Bread and Cake Bread being a very well-known brand. In fact, I'll tell you a quick anecdotal story. This is a few years ago when the Kings, the LA Kings won the Stanley Cup. Uh, a, a neighbor was the captain, so we figured they'd be having something. And I took them a bottle of Cake Bread Cab as a gift and, and the girlfriend came to the gate. Wouldn't let me into the party, unfortunately. <laughs> but said, uh, oh, this is our favorite wine. So I thought, oh, well, okay, great. So you, you, there's emerging markets all over the world, obviously, and China, China's being one of them. And it, it seems to me, after doing this, my 30th year of doing this, the Japanese were sort of ahead of the curve when it came to consumption of wine, when it came to consumption of fine wine, when it came to consumption of California wine. And, and now China finally has sort of given up on just first growth Bordeaux and those kinds of things. And they're actually experimenting with some interesting you know, varietals and things that we can prevent them. Was that sort of the 
what was happening back then? Did you feel, uh, you said it was an uphill battle with some of these people, but that we were able to get credibility through this sort of yeah, migration? Well, I think in, um, first of all, the, the profession of, of a sommelier was a serious job in Japan. The, you know, it was a career for a lot of them. Other Asian companies or countries at that time, it wasn't viewed as that. It was a little mm. bit more of a transient position, wine really? buyers well, and stuff. But, but I thought Japan was probably uh, a lot more serious about it. And I was not in the conversations when Jack decided to connect up with uh, Jardine. I don't know if that was, maybe that was Hong Kong. Uh, anyway, they imported there. So yes, so once I came back to the States... After three years in Singapore, I naturally, I, I was going to go back. I was going to back to HP. I was, you know, we were going to live in Silicon Valley and go back to what we were doing. And I had been helping out now for several years at the winery. And at the end of the day, Dolores offered me a job to come on board and, wow. you know, work with her and support her and Jack and, and Jack on the international stuff and her on the the entertaining and culinary side at the winery. So I, I'm much better at um, learning by doing yes. versus uh, taking tests, right. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that Not was uh, so. You know, that's that's where I really clicked in to the wine industry and how much I loved it. And I've always been an outdoor girl, and part of my job during the harvest, uh, sort of like my internship, was out grape sampling and. I'm sure you're probably familiar with Fine Hill Ranch mm-hmm. uh, Vineyard over on the west side of Oakville. I was what Cake Bread has been purchasing Cabernet from them for years, decades. So I had my little baggie and I was out sampling and I was standing in that vineyard early one morning and it was just such a beautiful day. Yeah. And I stopped and I looked around. And uh, that was my aha moment. I'm like, I belong here. That's great. And and then I reached in to grab a couple of berries off a cluster, and there was a rattlesnake stretched out on the cane. Oh, <laughs> I'm no. like, so I jumped about ten feet in the air wow. and took off running. But um, <laughs> uh, and then I never went back to that row. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> so, that's the aha moment. I, yeah, yeah, that was an aha <laughs> moment for sure. So, but I, I think that's what really resonated with me. I just felt because. I, I love the outdoors and I love being outdoors. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense about, for me. About to what be year here. was that? What year was that? Yeah. So that must have been in the late 80s. So California wine at that time was progressing. The Judgment of Paris was over. People started to recognize we had things to sell. Uh, was consumerism, I mean, I, and I want to get to this conversation about today's marketplace and the, how crowded it is and how difficult it is to be in this industry. So, um, but it was different then. It was still sort of emerging. Was it not at that point? It was. And uh, one thing I got involved in with uh, Jack was the Napa Valley Vintners. So Jack had been on the board of the Napa Valley Vintners at a period of time uh, back in the 70s. And so they had an international, they created an international committee for members, and we had a group of vintners that would travel around the world promoting Napa Valley wines first and then our own brands second. Mm -hmm. So we were really on a mission to educate the world about Napa Valley, and I think that went a long way, and it's still going on today. But it was so rewarding for me to be part of that group. I mean, I was out there with, you know, John Schaefer and yeah, you know right. the you know the Mondavis all the and all, the, all you know the first generation <laughs> basically and so I learned a lot working with on I spent a lot of time on committees with the, the Napa Valley Vintners as well as you know immersed in cake bread cellars and I just learned a lot by just by doing and uh, you know building a brand is hard it, and now you're building a brand around a region which is even just as tough particularly I'm assuming uh, that at that era still. The premium Burgundies and the premium Bordeaux were you know, oh, king. Oh, yes. You know, and you were against that, and the California is the new world. Right. And when they saw the price of our wines, yeah. they balked, and then they said, well, why wouldn't I just buy a Bordeaux? Right, that's right. Like, because you should try Napa. Well, it was funny. I was reading my dad's old newsletter when I was talking to Mr. Spurrier 
about uh, the judgment of Paris, and I was reading the newsletter where my dad had copied the Time article and wrote s- some things about it. I think he was selling it for five fifty a bottle. So, fi- and it, of course, we called it a fifth back then. Five fifty a fifth. I'm like five fifty. <laughs> Jeez, are you kidding? I just started to buy some Fay Vineyard Stag's Leap. I think it was one hundred and eighty dollars yeah, a bottle. Five hundred and fifty. It's a crazy <laughs> number, right? Right. So you, you, it sounds like then you were part of this sort of emerging uh, relationship with the world for California wines and that you were in the forefront of trying to make things happen. So Cake Bread, obviously one of the great brands of the, of the business, and you've, you now want to branch out on your own. You want to create a brand of your own. And I am a huge fan of the Pinot Noir. Thank you. Just we, I think I used it in the club a few months ago. But... It's a different. That's a different part of the game. You're you're in marketing. You're in New Delhi. You're talking to the Indians. You're uh, the Indians. That doesn't sound right. You're talking to the, <laughs> yeah. Well, they are Indians, <laughs> they, East Indian. Uh, you're talking to them about consumption of, of California wines, and and it's a different world now. You are sort of entrenched in trying to not only craft it, but sell it, and it becomes now your baby. So what, yes. what was that thought process? What were you thinking when you wanted well, to do that? I think that, you know, like any successful business, the winery was growing, Cape Bread Cellars was growing. And um, I, I really want to be involved in every step of the process. I love the vineyards. I love being out the outdoors. I love walking the vineyards and tasting the fruit. And, you know, I get excited every time there's bud break every year. Mm -hmm. You know, the the cycle is the same every year, but it's different every year. And I just, um, I I just wanted to be involved in every step of the way. And I found I was, you know, we were getting busier and um, at the winery and I didn't have as much time to do that. So, you know, that was, that was part of the reason that I just thought, well, the only way I'm going to do this is, to do something just on my it. own. Right. And that was in 2008, like the that's, really that's, uh, bad time to yeah, start that, a new business. It, there's a recession going <laughs> yes. on, and you know, this is an expensive yes. process, and yes. it t- takes some capital to do this. And so you landed on your mother's name, Anna Ziada, and she's from Naples. No, she was born here, though. She was born, born in Washington. Uh, Washington State, but my grandparents came from Naples, yes. Okay, so this is interesting to me. You started with Sauvignon Blanc. You started with Pinot Noir, and we already discussed that one's Bordeaux, one's Burgundy, and uh-huh. how, how like you know how uh, c- clashing that is. But uh, Naples is, in a, for me, one of the most fascinating districts or Campania in Italy, uh, because there are a lot of ancient varietals there mm-hmm. that they're recultivating, and there's some pioneers down there that are taking some of these really cool varietals. And, and bottling them again and finding them and DNA testing them and trying to figure out, you know, what they what were. What it is, yeah. Yeah, really fun stuff. It, but you're, you have Italian background and you, you went with these two grapes. It, well, uh, partly this is what I'm surrounded by. Um, but I did, well, a lot of my friends thought I was crazy at first that I was starting a new company in 2008 as they're <laughs> going so, into a, a deep financial crisis. And did you believe them or uh, did you? <laughs> well, uh, I just, you know, the thing is I, didn't overthink it. If I would have thought about it more, I probably wouldn't have done it. But uh, so back to my days in the kitchen and spending a lot of time around food at the winery, uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir to me are the most versatile wines with food. And so when, when I'm in now my own project now, that's the focus is food and what, what, how the wine should be made excuse me, to be compatible with, more compatible with food. And so what I learned about that was really the level of acidity in wine and how important that is uh, and and how it's not only food compatible, but also ageability and it keeps that freshness in the wine. And I like fresh, yeah, I don't like really clawing heavy wines. I like fresh, lively, sassy wines. So it's interesting because we were at the restaurant the other night and we had, I told you we had this Burgundy, it was, you know, and these vineyards are from, who knows, the 12th century it could be, right? And there's something about the value of the age, the history, the understanding. And I was I relay the story all the time about Mich- Michel Roland explaining to a young winery in, in Armenia that, Okay, we got to wait a hundred years to figure out what this thing's going to do. Mm. And so there's, and then yesterday when we were tasting in in the valley floor here, 
there was a winery we went to, and it was clear. It was, just, it was just a young group. It was just a young winery, and the wines were good. There was no flaws in them, but they just didn't have this exquisite uniqueness about them. And I find that part of the wine business really, really fascinating. And, that, and, and this is a tough question. This is a tough question, and I, I've never got the, the real answer. But Okay. <laughs> the, because I don't know if there is one. Yes. But there's something about the grape that is... Uh, that does that, right? And it's a sense of, as Mike Salachi says, a time and place, right? And I think what you're explaining is that you want to bring that time and place to the table. I do. I do, because I, I know what goes into planting a vineyard, growing grapes, and the passion and the love uh, that go into that. And, you know, I, my approach to wine was I really wanted to have something that's very balanced and elegant, but also expresses the personality and the fruit and not, not hide that or bury it with oak or anything and else. Do, and you do that well. Well, Chicago. I have a fantastic winemaker. Well, well, but it's more than that. It's, you know, yes. the, it's like it's going to a restaurant with a chef that, you know, as a cook, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to going to a restaurant that has a chef. Right. right? It's chef-centric versus a, a cook restaurant. Um, but the question is, it's a, the grape you know, the historical, why is it the grape that creates this sense, this ethereal value to a glass of wine or a meal? You don't do it with pineapple wine. You can go to, you can go to Hawaii and go to Maui, get Maui Blanc, you know, yeah, right. or you can get apricot wine from anywhere in the Caucasus. But what, why does the grape do this? To, why does it create such memory and, and palatability with food? It is an emotional it is, right? Beverage. Yeah. And, it's a very emotional um, beverage. Yes. I, I, think, I think some of it has to do with the history of wine. It goes back centuries. And, you know, it's always sort of been part of life. And I, I just think that there is some probably romance in that, in that history. Uh, if you're looking for a scientific answer, I don't have that. Yeah, I don't know. There is one. <laughs> yeah, so. I, had a, I had a botanist and a, and a winemaker who had studied biology, and then she's like, I don't know what the answer yeah, question no, is. But I, I, I believe it's emotional. I think yeah. partially emotional. I think part of it is there is there's something, there's a higher calling to the grape, and it's there. I mean, look, let's, if you go back to the Bible, and Noah landed the, the uh, ark on Mount Ararat in Armenia, and he planted grapes, and of course it goes on to say he got drunk, but, you know, that's, that's okay too, right? But, you know, and then they found an Armenia, a winery in Armenia that was 6,000 years old with the amphora and the sandals and the whole thing, so it's, it's really pretty amazing historical beverage right. that doesn't, um, it, we were talking the other night at dinner, you know, if, I, if I'm going to have a, a beer and I, I ask for a Heineken because I like Heineken and it's going to taste like Heineken, and if I ask for uh, a Jack Daniels on the rocks, which we do quite frequently, you know, that's mm-hmm. I'm asking because it tastes like Jack Daniels. That's what I want. But we don't do that with wine. We, we, we're looking at the food. We're looking at the, the experience. We're looking at who we're with. We're looking at what, what I... And you have to want to feel like, I feel like Sangiovese today. Or I feel like Pinot Noir. And that's, that part's different than any other beverage. And it fascinates me to, to figure that out. So you, you now are making Pinot, you're making Sauvignon Blanc. Um, yesterday we had a gorgeous, I think it was a Bordeaux blend that you're making now. Oh, the Mia Madre. Yeah. My mother in Italian. Oh, so that's it. Yeah. Right? Mia Madre. Yeah, yeah. My mother. Okay. Well, I want to talk about your mom for a second. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Yes. She, okay. she uh, sounds, and I, it's funny that I, when I read this in, in your bio, that she was like a true Rosie the Riveter, right? But she was a but She was, yeah. She was living in um, Washington State, and when she finished up school, her and a girlfriend went to Seattle. They were living outside of Seattle, and she got a job working in the shipyards. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and, and she, you know, welding was her thing, and... She loved it. She, was, she like, was an arc welder. Yeah, that helmet down and, yeah. <laughs> and zapping that thing. And she, she, I guess she's. I guess I'm. I am like her in that way. But it's like very hands on sort of. When experience. was this approximately? Was this war, part of the war effort? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All the men were off to war, and and the women were home. Um, welding. Welding. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. There's there were, a Rosie the Riveter museum. I haven't been to it yet. Over in Oakland. 
Is there really? Yes. Oh, I don't think I've seen the heard of that because the other day I was at a store and I couldn't believe there was a new product. There wasn't an old product. A Rosie the Riveter doll. It came with a little diorama that you could buy for your kids. And I think, wow, there, there's a resurgence in that. And it, 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 that is, you know, part of history that I think people should learn and understand. The now, women can do more than it. just you know bake cakes and make dinner. Because it, that's so that's interesting. Because there's a movement, and I, though I haven't read about it in let's say the last few months. But the women in wine movement that was so that, that came to uh, the fruition, not fruition, but to the surface of the news not too long ago, um, kind of like chefdom, you know, for the longest time it was dominated by the, my men. And now there's a lot of my daughters have, uh, well, she just earned a Michelin star where she works as the head baker. Oh, nice. So I get, I get it. Uh, but what, what's your take on that movement? Um, is there is there a serious discrepancy in not employment to say, but you know, qualified women winemakers? I and mean, this I've talked to a lot of them. Well, I, you know, they're all they're obviously in in every industry the trailblazers. You know, the women that say, "Why is this just a man's job? I can do this, and yes. I'm interested in this, and I want to do this." So they go, you know, to college and and learn the business and start making wine. I think that we are seeing more and more women now at UC Davis and more women getting involved in farming the vineyards as well as making wine. So it's not it's not just a man's world anymore. And and I think that it's um people have a passion about it. That's I mean, it. you know, the, the chefs where do they learn how to cook? From their grandmother or their mothers, usually. The, Correct. The, the guys. <laughs> the guys are growing up with grandma or mama in the kitchen cooking, and then they go off to be, you know, famous chefs. But um, the women, I, I think, I, I'm happy to see more and more women get into the business and on all levels, you know. There's a little winery in Forceville called Trombetta. Uh, Ricky, the, it's a mother daughter deal. And we had a great podcast together. And she was also responsible for, for spearheading the AVA of Petaluma Gap. And it was, a, it was just a whole group of women. And the, it was like they were saying, what I read about it was, we were done, the kids were grown, and we were moving on to something new. And we think that Petaluma Gap deserved its own AVA. And so we, we got on it. And I, I had not heard anybody, I hadn't spoken to anybody up until then, that had actually done that, which seems like headwinds all the way through. But uh, right. they end up getting it done as a group of women getting it done. And uh, after all, your palate is better than ours anyway, right? Well, that's what they say. That's, that's, <laughs> Uh, sure. You know, I'm not going to knock you guys. So, You're not I, sure I, that? Yeah. No, I just think it's. Uh, I just think that women have a different approach yeah, to wine sure. than men do, and I see this from standing behind a table pouring wine for consumers, and how women approach wine is more emotional. Men like to get more technical in a lot of ways, but women want to hear the stories and. They want to feel that connection. And because my brand is in honor of my mother, I get into a lot of discussions with women. And that's sort of a connector yes. to to some people and men as well. I mean, they would come up to me after I spoke and tell me their mother story. So it was... Oh, that's cute. Yeah. That's it's really like, cute. Oh, well, yeah. we all have them, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> we, well, yeah, we all have a mother. <laughs> I just uh, I just lost mine in February, but she was oh. quite a cook. She, we we she left us with a two hundred page cookbook. Oh, from oh what a amazing treasure! Amazing recipes that she collected over the years and their stories around how she got them. And with my nieces and nephews and my sister uh, and my brother, we get on a Zoom call about every six weeks and we all make something oh. for you know two hours or so. And on a Zoom call. think about mom. Yeah, and my dad gets on the call and he tells us the story because some of them are Middle Eastern. The recipes that are that are just handed down, you know, and they're different. So, yeah. um, well, let's talk about that for a second. The the the, the passion of this industry, because um, passion isn't just I'm passionate about this. You know, I'm just happy to do it. Passion is sort of a culmination of years of headwinds to accomplish what you're doing, and now you're ten years into it, having started into a really difficult time to do it, and you're still here. And that's pretty amazing in this world. Yes, I have to pinch myself. 
Yeah, I'm still <laughs> alive, right? not, so. I mean, you know, you don't think about the hard times, but you, you, I take after my mother, no matter what life throws in your path, you just put your head down and keep going forward and, um, you just kind of plow through it. So every there's little There's plenty thing. of headwinds in this industry. <laughs> yes. So tell me, uh, you, you were talking about when you're in the, the vineyard and this rattlesnake came out, but you're, you're tasting the thing. This is another subject that I love to peel back with, with, uh, the wine makers and wine proprietaires, maybe in French, um, this, the idea, for instance, when I asked Stephen Spurrier who, what his favorite wine was, he said there was a 29, it was either Cheval Blanc or one of the premium growths in Bordeaux. Okay, in 1929, we didn't have labs and we didn't have, you know, pH testing necessarily or refractometers maybe, whatever we use to decide what we're going to do to pick. Mm-hmm. And you're in the vineyard with a baggie and you're trying to pick berries and you bring them home and, and like your husband's probably like, God, we're having grapes again for dinner, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right? So... <laughs> But here, here, and I was talking to Peter Mondavi. He, he said that their 1949 or their 45 Vineyard Select or Special Select Cabernet just got 100 points from somebody. And I'm thinking, how does that happen when none of the technologies existed to do that? And it was pure passion that had to do it and an experience with what the grape should taste like and mm-hmm. the thick, whatever, this, whatever you guys do. So what were you looking for, for instance, that day when you're picking berries and you're tasting it? What are you, what are you trying to find? Well, I love going out... And the, through once the fruit's through veration, and uh, I start tasting. And you can just, you know, for me, it's exciting to just to taste it as it's ripening. And, and although we use chemistry to make our ultimate picking decisions, we also pick on taste. And there are some years you have to have a lot of patience and you see the sugars are spiking, but the flavor's not there. It just doesn't taste ripe enough. Uh, you just have to be patient and hold your breath and um, wait for it so to come around the, the corner. Sugar, you're looking for the sugar. You're looking for the phenol. They call it the phenolic yeah. ripeness or yeah. the overall mm-hmm. value of the grapes quality. And then, I mean, at that point, it's you only have time to work with, right? I mean, you don't, you can't change the trellising at that point. There's the canopying, all that stuff. Doesn't you get matter. one shot. Yeah, yeah that's it, right? And that's kind of leads you to why. Michelle Roland would say, you got 100 years to figure this out because you only get one time a year right. unless you've got experimental vineyards to play with, which is expensive, right? Right. Um, to, to decide what we're going to do next and what this is going to produce. And then you have to say, all right, this is what I'm getting and I think I can produce a wine of this caliber. So one of the movements going on today is the organic side of things, and I, the more I read, the more I talk to people, you know, biodynamics is the next level. We understand that. It's, it has to deal with the, and I'll tell you what, one of the things that was told to me. But the, the organic movement is not new, right? It's, it's not new. But the marketplace makes you feel like, oh, this is organic. This is better for you. The whole thing. Right. I mean, seriously, was it, or, was it not organic? Decades I mean, ago? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. Just, that's just the way it was. Yeah. Well, I think that I think that um, I think organic is a personal philosophical approach as well. And I, I, my property up in Calistoga is all organic. And they said, "Oh, are you certified certified organic?" And I said, "No, that's not the point." You right, know, that's right, that just, it's, it's not, that's I'm not doing point. it for a marketing, uh, you know, promotional story. I'm doing it because. That's how I feel about it, and I want um, I want everything to be organic and clean, and um, yeah. And it does produce, you know. The, uh, it's kind of interesting. I can tell on um, ones that are verbosely organic, and sort of speak that they really. I mean, sometimes it has like a horse manure character, right? You know, they put the, they put oh, we call them. that earthy. Yeah, earthy, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, but you know, the, the the cleanliness of the wine comes through. I think that's pretty obvious when mm-hmm. you haven't acidulated it and added sugar and do all these other mm-hmm. things to it. But, and I I do believe there's a value to it, uh, health wise, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe. But the most common comment I get from particularly European winemakers is, "Look, my kids are playing in that vineyard, right? And right. I don't want them crawling around and." All these different chemicals. Pesticides or, yeah. Yeah, all the things that are happening. Pesticides, yeah. And we didn't have them anyway in 
before. And I, what is there? Seventy five com- compounds that you can put in a wine now, like mega purple and acid, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And this book kind of tells you he he starts to establish the idea of what's happened in modern winemaking um, to to do that. But here's here's a comment that was made to me by um, the grandson of the guy that founded Sasakaya. Okay, uh, he said in the biodynamic side of things, if the moon can move the ocean, if the gravitational pull of the moon can move the oceans, think about what it does to your body, which is mostly water, right? And I thought, okay, that's a pretty profound idea that if, if they're going to use a biodynamic movement, they're going to use the, the cycles of the moon and the sun, and they're going to decide when they're going to pick and plant and do those and how they're going right. to store the bottles. Well, that's how the Native Americans yeah, right? lived. There could be value to mm-hmm. that. I don't know how you prove that, except that Except one of the things that does happen in the marketplace, and I make you laugh at this, there's no hangovers with organic wine. We don't have a hangover. Or we don't, we don't, I'm like, come on. It's still 12% or 14% alcohol, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It's still alcohol in there. Yeah. It's still we happen. all have a different level of tolerance for alcohol. That's true. <laughs> well, you know, there's a thing, um, <clears throat> was gluto, gluto. Okay, somebody just introduced, maybe I'll send you some. I have samples. It's some kind of sticky uh, compound. And it's a, it, you're supposed to rub it on your belly after you've had too much wine. Oh. And it, it, and somebody told me that they did a breathalyzer test before and after using this stuff. And it changed the absorption of the alcohol and it decreased his you know, br- breathalyzer count oh. considerably. That's, you ever heard that's of this? a new one. No, I haven't heard of that. Because it could, be, it could set the world on fire. No right? kidding. No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so yeah. you, you decided now to make a, um, a Bordeaux blend. And what's in this wine? Right. Uh, you know, I took baby steps. You can imagine. Um, I don't have any partners. I didn't have any investors. It was just me, myself, and I. That's smart. And I, uh, so Sauvignon Blanc, you know, that's, all, I do love that varietal a lot. Uh, but also part of the reasoning behind that, starting with that, was it's quicker to market. And then the Pinot also, you're not holding, you know, not aging it and, and uh, as long as you would a Cabernet or a red Bordeaux style blend. So I took baby steps. Um, I wanted to get to Cabernet at some point, but I wanted to, to do a blend first. Why? Because I felt like blends were a little bit more approachable mm-hmm. uh, as a young wine. And I didn't really want to be making a wine that people were going to stick in their cellar, you know, for five or ten years before they drink it. I, I wanted to make a wine that people could pop the cork and drink it now, or they could lay it down for ten or fifteen years or whatever. But so the Bordeaux blend, uh, the Mia Madre, is the original idea, uh, which didn't completely come to fruition, was a Cab Cab Franc blend. Yeah, I fell in love with a Cab Franc up on the East Hills of Oakville mm. and just had those really beautiful violets and purple characteristics in, in the grape that I, I loved. And it didn't have the typical herbal um, mm-hmm. personality that Cap Franc typically does have. So the problem became finding Cap Franc. There's, it's not widely planted, and what is planted is usually used in blending, and, and uh, so it's also just as expensive as buying Cabernet. Is it really? It oh, is. That's interesting. It's, it commands... Because of the percentage that's planted, that's just not as much around? Yeah, it's a fickle grape to yeah. grow, and so I think people would rather just... Growers would just say, hey, I'd rather... It's much easier growing Cabernet than Cap Franc. But uh, that's like one of my little passion projects is, is finding the ultimate Cab Franc. So I was making a Cab Franc just on its own, but I wanted Cab Franc in this blend, but I could not find enough to do sort of a 50-50-ish blend. Uh, so one day, a friend of mine has a vi- that has a vineyard down in Coonsville said, hey, I have some Malbec. I'm like, oh, huh. Okay. Let's try that. That's interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. so the approach. first, the first, I tar- started that project in 2012. The first blend um, turned out to be 50 percent Malbec, and wow, that's a um, lot that is Valley. a lot. And this is a, it is kind of a funny story. If I have a second to tell yeah, you, yeah, please. So, when uh, when I, you know, I was sitting down with the winemaker and I said, "All right, this is a cab blend. Cab's taking the lead." So we're 
she's doing all these trial blends and she, you know, I would taste them. I'm like, no, I think there's too much mold back in there. And so we went back and forth and she said, all right, I am going to do a double blind blending session with you. Uh Uh-oh. So all the components are blind and I'm just going to give you trial blends and her and her assistant winemakers, and then we're going to decide what the blend is today. I'm <laughs> like, okay, because we've been going, we've been batting this blend around for a, a while. It's always trouble when they go into blind tasting. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they were blending away, and uh, we all took our notes, and at the end of the day, we agreed on all of the, you know, we all agreed on the same blend, and it was 50% Malbec. Okay, that's hilarious. And I'm like, okay. You know what? It wants to be the leader of the band on this vintage, so let it. But I was terrified because I thought, you know, it's a pricey bottle. Uh, I said, who is going to spend that much money for a Malbec Cabernet? It just didn't. Just don't tell them. Yes. Well, that that was what I was most fearful of. And so I was at a tasting with a a trade tasting, uh, and I was featuring the Sauvignon Blanc, but I had the I had the uh, unreleased Mia Madre under the table. So some of my friends would come by, uh, winemaker friends, and and I said, "Do you want to taste something?" And they said, "Sure." So I give them a little taste of, of the wine, and and they said, "Well, what is it?" I said, "Well, it's a Bordeaux blend." So so why don't you tell me, you know, what is your opinion as the lead varietal? There's a lead varietal, and they mostly guessed Cab Franc really? because Cab Franc and Malbec kind of have a similar yeah, they have personality, a yeah. and they're both. Right you know, have good natural acidity and they both have a lot of aromatics. And, um, so I told them it was Malbec. They're just like, wow, that's so awesome. That, I think that's fascinating because I think most of the public <laughs> thinks, Oh, if you're a winemaker, or you're a SOM or you're an MW, whatever, you can detect everything and you can, which is very hard to do as you know. And here you have a Malbec, which is a very unusual 50 Malbec yeah. in Napa Valley. You don't, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it really. So it moves around a bit. You know, the blend has changed over time. Sometimes it's more Malbec leaning, sometimes more Cabernet leaning. But now that I've, now that I've been doing this with, um, since 2012, I've locked oh, so in. So we've got a few I've, vintages. Yeah, there, I've locked in the vineyards. I said, okay, this is the cab I want, uh, which ended up being the Bextoffer George III vineyard in uh, Rutherford. Pedigree so place. that's yeah. So that's the uh, backbone of the blend now, and there's still some Melbec in there, and sometimes there's some Cab Franc and. Maybe a little petite for dough. Yesterday we were at a winery, and by the time they were done, since she, the uh, hostess told us, uh, learned that we were uh, in the trade. So we ended up tasting everything but a Malbec. So this winery had bottled a cab, obviously. They had bottled a Merlot, which is pretty standard, but they also bottled a petite for dough, which was mostly like 95%. And they had bottled a uh, Cabernet Franc. Mm-hmm. And uh, Distinctively different wines, uh, clearly, right? I mean, clearly expressive of the grape rather than right. necessarily the soil. But you have to live by this idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that's what the French have been doing for forever, at least in Bordeaux, right? Right. Um, when I was working the shops, so about when cake bread was founded, uh, my dad had a store from '69 to about '85. And it was very popular at that time, and I remember, I'll never forget this, putting on the shelf a wine that said 100% Cabernet Sauvignon on the label, like they had put the percentage. This was so important to the California wine trade to do that, right? pre, pre sort of the success level. And I thought, and now that we th- learn that we can actually put things together and get approachable wine, get an ageable wine, right? right. Make things happen. Right. So we had that yesterday, I think. Mm. It was great. Yeah. We, we really enjoyed it. So now the whole lineup is Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir. Um, Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Oh, we didn't taste that yesterday. And, um, the Mia Madre. The Mia Madre. And then my pinnacle wine, finally, the Cabernet. Oh, we didn't taste that either. <laughs> yeah. So. And that's all through Trincaro. How did, that ha- how did that relationship start? Yes. Yeah, so that's another interesting story. I see. I have never planned my life. It's just happened. Yes. And... Um, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I never planned to be in the wine business. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yes. So I've, I just sort of, um, I do sort of live instinctively and, and evolve instinctively. So I was at a grape growers harvest party several years ago and Bobby Torres 
who is the nephew um, of Bob Trinkero. Mm-hmm. His sister, his, Bob, Bobby's mother was Bob Trinkero's sister. So uh, anyway, he, he, he came over to my table. We all had our wines on everybody's table, and he had some Pinot, uh, my Pinot on his table. And he came over and he said, I love these wines. I love your packaging. I love everything. He said, we, we should do a partnership. And I looked at him with a blank stare, and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. What were you doing then, though? How were you distributing? I was just selling. I was, just, I was doing it myself. Wow. Yes. Um, <laughs> that, was, yes. that is doing it yourself. Yes. Right? And uh, so I said, uh, okay, well, it's harvest, so maybe we should chat after we get through harvest. So we reconnected and started the conversation. And it wasn't an instantaneous partnership. We we spoke off and on probably for about a year and a half. Uh, I didn't really understand how a tiny little brand like Ziata would fit into their world until I learned that they were creating a new portfolio within the company that was focused on smaller production, family-owned so brands. And the philosophy is why create something knew if it already exists and it's a good fit for us. So they invited me in to the family. Yeah, that's great. And it was perfect timing, actually, because I was getting to a point where it was just getting harder and harder to sell wine at at, uh, such a small level. I mean, all the distributors all want those, you know, little gems in their portfolios, but then not a lot of energy goes in to selling them. They're not paying the bills. Yes. So it was getting, and then you were talking about, you know, this, all these new brands flooding into the market and competition was, you know, greater and it was harder to get distributors' attention. So in California, I was just selling everything direct because I can That's here. That's hard. That's really hard. And it's hard to get down to your part of the world yeah. in Southern California when I was entrenched in Northern California yes. and I, I sold most of my wine right here in Napa Valley. Yeah. So that's that. That allowed me to grow. I'd already added the Cabernet because we we sealed the deal in uh, early 2016. I think January of 2016, and I had already harvested my first uh, vintage of Cab. That was another story. You know, the, <laughs> so everything I, I is a story. That. Yeah, uh, but you're in a great family. I mean, the the, the my relationship with Trincaro's goes way back. At least my dad had a small relationship with Bob. But yeah, Bruce Nyers here, uh, their import portfolio is incredible. And they seem to understand what it takes to get this to the consumer. Because let's just face it, to anybody that's listening, that this is business too, right? And the, right. the passion of it and the emotion of it and all that's great and fun. And that's what it takes to be good at it. But eventually it's got to pay the bills. And so Correct. I think that's, you're in a great place for yes. that. Yeah, the family, our values are very aligned. Yeah. You know, they're just down to earth, great people for the success that they have accomplished over the years with a lot of hard work. And um, they're, Allows just, us to sit here they're just normal right. people. Right. <laughs> you know? just not, don't, yeah. don't be afraid of them. <laughs> yes, no, and they're so uh, supportive of the community and they're just, they're an amazing family. And I couldn't imagine partnering up with somebody. Else, you know, there are not too many people I could think of off the top of my head that I I could merge into. I can um, see that. Yeah, so there's we're, not that many around. Frankly. No, I mean, I hate to say that. I mean, there's there are a lot of great family wineries out there, but it's just they just have this, um, vi- you know, vision of life that is aligns with my vision. So you're we, lucky. You're fortunate. I say lucky. Yeah. Um, Tell me about the cab harvest, and then we'll wrap up with, I want to tell you a little bit about what, what happens in my world and, yes. and what you think yeah. we're going to be doing going forward because okay. COVID has changed a lot. But tell me about the right. cab harvest. That sounds fun. So cab, uh, you know, I finally uh, became a Napa Valley true producer. Yeah, because <laughs> made, of Cabernet. Made, made yeah. a Cabernet right. now. <laughs> uh, and I added, the only thing I've added since the partnership with Trinquero knew is that was the Chardonnay project. So uh, a friend of mine, who uh, was doing a little bit of sales um, consulting for me before my Trincaro partnership. Uh, He knew what I liked. He knew the style of wines I liked. He knew all of my wines. And uh, he became the estate 
manager for Meteor Vineyards down mm-hmm. in Coombsville. And he called me up one day in 2015 and he said, we just had some fruit become available and you need to buy it. I'm like, oh, hmm. all right. I don't know where I'm going to get the money. Yeah, right. Uh, but you know, it's tied up that, in a tank. It somewhere. was like sort of starting my business. You just you just jump off the cliff and right. figure it out later. Right. And that's kind of what happened with the Cabernet. I said, I sure, why not? Right. I, you know, I just, <laughs> winemaker and I went over there. Jennifer was familiar with that vineyard because she had worked with it for another client. And um, Mike Wolf planted it and farms it, who I know quite well, and his you know top of the line quality farming and passion. So I just I just did it and I was happy I I, I took the leap. Well, it made it official. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. now I'm it's official like wine producer. This is great. Yeah, the the downside of that is it's like everybody's like, "Oh, you sell all your wine and de- you know, direct to consumer on your mailing list." And I said, "Yes, but I don't have a Cabernet mailing list because I haven't had a Cabernet up until, you know, basically 2017 when it was released." It is the king of yeah. the red grape. Yes, but I'm I'm getting there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm building my cab drinker mailing list. So let's, let's we're getting on an hour, so I want to wrap this up. Take not take too much more of your time, but I think we'd be remiss in not approaching the COVID change. You know what's happened in my industry and and what leading into COVID, which is not helping us uh, market wines, particularly direct to the consumer. Uh, so I'm going to start with this. There's there was. There's so many choices now for the consumer. They get online. There's, I mean, you know, you can go to Groupon and get 15 wines for 45 bucks, and and so, and I compete with this stuff all the time. This is what I do, right? I'm in the, I'm full digital marketeer. I no longer mail anything. We used to mail a million pieces of mail a year. That was like what we did, and it's changed, right? So, uh, what they're doing is they're bringing in one euro per liter stuff from all over. It comes into New York. I even know the path. It comes into New Jersey. It gets trucked in New York. It's bottled in a bunch of different brands. I mean, you name it. Saturday Night Live, Beaujolais. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's right. Right? And, <laughs> and then it gets thrown out at there into clubs like mine that are selling really crap, and but cheap. And so what does that do? Well, that bottle of wine no longer gets to be sold by a winery like yours or Trinquero or anybody else that's doing it. And so that consumption has already been lost to somebody else. Then COVID hits. And all of the restaurants stopped buying. Done. We know this. Were you an on-premise? I am a lot of probably on-premise, right? 85% on-premise. Okay. So you, you, the pain is real. Yes. Pain is real. Yes. Uh, so you move the DTC. Uh, well, I've always done a little bit. I don't have a huge mailing list just because I, I, I keep it pretty clean. Yeah. So how have you reacted to... And I was—I didn't anticipate this question, but how have you reacted to this? Because I have—we have two family members that own restaurants. You know, they're not buying much. They're open now. Uh, they only get twenty-five percent capacity here inside. So I, I think it's going to be a little bit of a while before that volume goes up. But what's happened? And you were talking about this earlier, briefly. Uh, if you're in a book like Southern Wines and Spirits or Youngs, and you're not sending the rep to Hawaii because they sold you ten cases of your wine, you're not getting any attention, right? You're just not getting it. Correct. And now, Southern and Young's and other wholesalers have laid off thousands. You know, I'm not criticizing them, but they just laid off thousands. Right. No, they've furloughed quite a few. Yeah, and people. they've gone into telesales. And like the other day, I actually had to order Stag's Leap, Faye Vineyards, Cabernet through the internet. Just place an order. Couldn't even talk to the guy. You know? mm, Send yeah. me an email, got an email back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm not there. <laughs> so, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen here? And how are we going to react to it? together as a group. right well you know it's been an it's been a learning curve i think for all of us it, particularly those on premise brands uh you know retail apparently i'm told is booming yes it is um, and i believe that a lot of brands are now looking on premise brands are now looking at retail in a different way because for a while this is going to be probably one of the only ways to really sell wine till the restaurants are back up and running um, I, I have, exp- so what I've been doing is, yeah, I'm continuing to communicate with my mailing list on a monthly basis. I am doing a lot of virtual tastings, supporting the sales, the sales directors across the country. 
And they're working really hard. They're getting really innovative on, on how to do things. And I, I believe, and I think that Trencaro is a master at this, is relationship building. Yes. And continuing, you know, like, you can talk to somebody at Trencaro if you want to order the wine, or, you know, you would get a real person. But um, I just think that that supporting the trade through these difficult times, the restaurants um, particularly, We'll come back in spades when everything's back up and running. Here's what I think, and you're, you're right on. Uh, 90s, no problem. You, I could call Trincaro, or I could call Young's, or I could call Southern, and I'd say, hey, I'm doing a lot of wine tasting. We're going to get a bunch of consumers there. We're going to pour some wines, and we're going to do what you used to do. You know, when I used to go to the early tastings, Dickie Smothers was there, and Fess Parker was there, and Pot Paulson were there, and they are pouring wines because it was... That was a different part of their life, right? And that all dried up, you know, somewhere in the early 2000s. If I tried to call and put together a wine tasting for the consumer, we don't have the time, we don't have the people, it's too expensive, we don't see any value. And I think that swung around again. And I think either through the virtual premise, which we've, I've done a few with my customers already, and, mm-hmm. and uh, the first time on last Tuesday, which is the day I taste wine, Sean came in from Tricaro and opened his laptop, and there was Bruce Nyer standing there. And Bruce and I know each other from way back, so we had a great chat, tasted wine live. And I thought that was fascinating. I'd love to do that with you yes, and some yes, of the wines. Yes. And possibly with my consumer base, mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to start a wine show. This is so important for you and other wineries and, and people like me that there's this digital presence, live right. action stuff. Yeah. Now, this thing we're going to re- we're recording, so we don't have to worry about you know, yeah. mistakes. But <laughs> we're going to yeah. edit it later. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think it's so important that we're now really back to this sort of hand sell in consumer education for a couple of reasons. One is that relationship gets built, like you just said. And two, uh, we, can ex- we can educate the consumer on what's real. Right. What the real wines are about, yeah. what the real stories are. Yesterday we went to a winery, and I, want, I don't want to mention any names, but you know, the story was you know, the guy loves music, and he named the vineyards after the music, the, you know, certain songs, and then each wine that he produces, like this blend, is a blend of the songs. I mean, that's not a story to me. That's not a history. We have history in front of me here no, that, that tells a story, and I think that's important for people to hear, understand, whether it's virtually, live, at a tasting, whatever it is. But we're back to sort of kind of hand-selling. Yeah, kind of put together. yeah, I think so. And I, you know, I've done some virtual tastings with my mailing list in small groups, and um, I've I've done some virtual uh, st- uh, retail tastings. You know, that our sales directors are in the store with, and I, I've done some winemaker dinners. I have a big one coming yeah, we're up. Back to that yeah, too. Yeah, right? coming back. Yeah, now so the country clubs. Um, you know, I think they were shut down a little bit in the beginning, but now these country clubs across the countries are are ramping up, and that's that's where a lot of the events that I've been doing lately are coming from. Yeah, great. And they're doing a big one next month uh, for breast awareness. In, that's great in uh, Texas, and I think there's 100 to 150 people. It's a it's a charity dinner, but I'm beaming in with my, my way maker from here. Excellent. And uh, the, the only scary part was is they told me that. I was going to be on a 24-foot screen. Oh. And I'm like, <laughs> well, <laughs> that is frightening. No close-up. I was I'm like, how my close-up, far Mr. back Demille. do I have to get yeah. from the camera? <laughs> I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, this has been a fascinating conversation, uh, Karen. I really appreciate uh, spending the time with us this morning. Mm-hmm. And I would like to do some virtual tastings with you and my Happy customers. Happy to. Um, I think that we're going to start seeing... I think it's important. And I think every time we do that, we keep a one-year-old bottle of junk off of the wine shelf, and that's what we have to teach the consumer. So thank you again for the time, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Cheers.